started looking at Thess 2 Thessalonians last week. I've been going through the little books of the Bible, and I thought rather than just cover this in one week, we'd uh, take a few weeks. We looked at chapter 1, uh, the benefits of suffering. Suffering helps us to grow. Um, the church at Thessalonica there was suffering, but they were also, verse 3 of chapter 1, your faith groweth exceedingly. Charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Suffering also prepares us for glory. Gets us ready for what God in, intends. And as well, suffering glorifies Christ today. Verse 12 of chapter 1, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and ye in him. You know, our, our world is in trouble. And they, they were aware of it all this time ago. Um, and it seems that faithful Christians suffer and godless people are promoted and, and so on. But in verse 7 of chapter 1, he says, You who are troubled, rest with us. And the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven. Now, God is going to sort everything out. We just need to make sure we're on the Lord's side. Now, he'll take care of, of uh, all of those things. And when, when we're suffering in the will of God, some of the things we looked at last week, you got them there in, in your notes. Uh, you can thank God for your salvation and the fact that he's with you. Uh, surrender to the will of God without complaining. Ask God to give you wi wisdom to understand his will. Uh, that's difficult sometimes because we, we think we know, but God has a different way he works things. Uh, look for opportunities to witness and glorify God in your situation. And then wait patiently until God's purpose is fulfilled and he is lifted up. Uh, suffering, it's... It's just a part of, of the Christian life. The, um, the Thessalonians were, were worried. Let's read chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. They, they thought that they were already in the tribulation, evidently. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Uh, they were suffering persecution, and they were thinking, oh, this, this must be the tribulation. Um, evidently, someone, someone had had a word from God <laughs> and said, oh, God said, well, listen, uh, that's, not, that's not how we go. Uh, the, evidently, there could have been even a fake letter. He says, a letter, and neither by letter, as from us. Someone had written like they were pretending that they were the Apostle Paul, and uh, they were discouraged, thinking, oh, we've, we've missed the rapture. We got left behind. The day of Christ, and people have been saying that the day of Christ is at hand, that they were, they were in it. Paul's explanation, um, what he basically says to them is that can't be because there's some things that have to take place first. And uh, one of the things in verse 5, he says, remember. You know, he told them all about this. He said, don't, don't go by circumstances. Don't go by, you know, what people are saying. Uh, remember what, what the Word of God is. And uh, Paul's explanation, number one, uh, the rapture had to take place. Verse one, the gathering together unto him. Uh, we talked about that. We've talked about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where he talks about uh, chapter 4, 17, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together, and be raptured. Uh, we're going to be gathered together to him. Uh, we've got the rapture, the tribulation, and then the revelation of Jesus coming again. In 1 Thessalonians, he, he talks at least twice about the fact that we're not going to go through wrath. 1 uh, Thessalonians 1.10, we're to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Uh, so first, the rapture has to take place. Secondly, in verse 3, the apostasy. Uh, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. He mentions two things in that verse, uh, the falling away and the man of sin being revealed. Uh, you know, this, this thing of falling away, uh, people aren't very godly right now. They weren't when, uh, when Paul was there. But apostasy now will seem very mild by comparison to the time he's talking about. And we'll look at that more in just a, just a moment. In, um, in, in Timothy, uh, he talks about, let's see, um, 1 
1 Timothy 4, in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. And in 2 Timothy um, 3, he says, in the last days perilous times shall come. And yet the, when, uh, when the tribulation comes, when those, those days come, there's a couple of things that are going to be different than what we're experiencing now. Number one, Christians will be removed. Uh, that's going to be different. We, you may not think Christians do much, but just the fact that there are Christians in the world does make a difference. Uh, it does have an effect. We act as salt and light. And later on we'll see that the Holy Spirit stops restraining. Uh, verses 6 and 7, we'll look at that more. But um, it, I believe it'll be a unique, unmistakable time. And uh, part of that in verse 3 is that the man of sin be revealed. The son of perdition. Look at verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that's called God or that is worshipped. So that, that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Now, this is going to be a, a strange time as the Antichrist. You know, if you read the um, book of Revelation and other places. He starts off as a peacemaker. He's going to bring people together that people thought could never be brought together. And then he's going to be a protector. He's going to unite people. going to make a covenant with Israel. But then he'll be a peace breaker. He breaks that covenant, invades Israel. And then he'll set up religion that the only one you can worship is him. And that's what it's talking about here. Uh, he's going to sit in the temple of God showing himself that, that he is God. And then, of course, later on, uh, he'll, be, he'll be a prisoner when, when Christ returns. But uh, uh, the man of sin will be revealed. Every once in a while, somebody comes up and people think, oh, maybe that's him. Maybe that's him, you know. And we've had our eyes on a, a couple of people, but uh, what, one right now, we're, we're wondering. But anyway, uh, the man of sin will, will be revealed, and that won't be, you won't be wondering. You know, you'll know. We, we won't be here, but anyway. Verse, the end of verse 4, uh, he as God sitteth in the temple of God, the temple will be rebuilt. Do you ever wonder why... Sometimes Christians get real excited when they hear about things happening with the temple being rebuilt. It's because they know, oh, well, when that happens, you know, we know that it's time. Uh, and in verse 5, he says, Remember ye not what, that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Uh, he, he wants us to remember. Th this, these are things not built on uh, emotions or feelings or uh, new revelations. Uh, we can go to God's word and see what he teaches uh, in verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us. Uh, you know, there's a big difference between man's word and God's word. And there's people who say all kinds of things about what's going to happen. Listen, we don't have to, uh, to look for what the world says. We need to remember what God has said. And that's, that's really important. Uh, the temple will be rebuilt. The man of sin be revealed. Uh, apostasy, the rapture. Uh, and as well, in verses 6 and 7, the rest restrainer removed. He says, now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. <laughs> it, this is one of those words that's changed in its meaning in English. Uh, we think of let as allowing something to happen. Uh, in these days, it meant not allowing it. He that hinders or restrains. And uh, that's talking about the Holy Spirit. You, you may not realize it, but God is restraining Satan's work right now. If he had, man, if he had free reign, we'd, it'd be a different world. And uh, in, in that time, it's not that the Holy Spirit leaves. God can't leave. He's, he's ever, everywhere present. But he stops his ministry of, of restraining. And uh, then, verse 8 and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Um, in that time, uh, the wicked, that wicked shall be revealed. And it's interesting in the end of verse 8, he just kind of projects to the end when Jesus will stop and destroy the Antichrist. Uh, whom the, it's almost like it's a parenthesis, whom, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Uh, he's given us hope even in just telling us, uh, you know, the Antichrist is coming, but you know, don't, don't worry, I'll, I'll take care of him. And he's going to be Satan's man. Do you notice there in verse 9? 
His coming, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and, and lying wonders. And let me tell you, our world is ready for that. Have you noticed? Uh, people are really looking for signs and wonders, amazing things. And I, I think they're prepared in the sense that uh, on films and things, they can, they can project anything. They can take a dead person and put them in a film, talk, walking and talking. Um, you know, it's just almost nothing they can't show to be happening, even though it's not happening. Uh, our world is ready for signs and wonders and all kinds of things. So what will happen? Number one, the wicked will be revealed. Two, Satan's man. And number three, people are deceived. Verse 10, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And to be saved, a person has to love the truth. Uh, people are deceived. We, we see a shadow of this now. You know, there's a lot of religion with people who don't love Jesus. They don't love the Bible. They don't love the church. It was interesting in, in this last um, vote on homosexuality, a, a lot of those in favor of homosexuality were, were churches. You know, churches would have ads for it. Uh, well... Uh, that's a shadow of, of things to come. Uh, they don't love the truth. And when you don't love the truth, the only thing that's left is delusion. You can build up a, a fantasy world. And the one of the interesting things is that those who hear and reject Jesus now will not be able to receive him then. Look at verse 11. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, I take that to mean that people who consciously reject the truth of God's word now, when the rapture takes place and, and Satan puts things in, in place and, and God's wrath and so on is going on, uh, it's going to be too late. They'll have already rejected the truth. Uh, they're going to believe a, a lie. Well, what should we do? Verses 13 and 14. Number one, we need to believe the truth. We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we need to believe the truth. God's word is truth. Uh, as a Christian, you need to know what you have in Christ. Now, I find a lot of people are looking for something else. Man, everything's here. Uh, we've got everything we need, more than, more than we can ever handle. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's just amazing what God has done for us. In verse 13, he talks about how we're, we're loved. Brethren, beloved of the Lord. Uh, from the beginning, he's chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Uh, in verse 14, he, he called you. Uh, we obtain uh, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, just a couple of verses, and already there's quite a few things that he talks about what we have in the Lord Jesus. We need to believe the truth. Uh, I love Romans 3.22 when he, he talks about righteousness, how it's unto all. You know, at this point in time, God's righteousness is available to everyone and upon all them that believe. See, faith is what makes the difference. God's righteousness, God's salvation, it's available to everyone. But you have to love the truth. Jesus said he's the, the truth. We need to love, love him and love his, his word. Faith is the key. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So number one, we need to believe the truth. Secondly, we need to guard the truth. Verse 15, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you've been taught, whether by word or our epistle. When he says stand fast, that means don't move away from it. You ever told somebody, you wait right here. <laughs> You come back and they're, they're gone, you know. Uh, not always. Don't move away from it. Stand fast. Hold. And verse, uh, verse 15 there. Hold the traditions. That means not careless. Uh, put some strength into it. Hold on to it. And if you're going down a cliff and you tell somebody, hold that rope, you, you don't want them just to look at it. They've got to put some strength into it. And uh, God wants us to guard the truth. And when he talks about traditions, he's not using it like the Catholics do where it's just things that they've, they've made up. He, he's talking here about the apostles' teachings, his scripture. Um, Jude, I think it was called it, the faith. What's the word he put in front of it? Fight, 
for the faith or anyway. Uh, we need to hold on to what God has, has taught us. It's like the word he used in verse 5, remember, guard the truth. Uh, it's not our ideas about the truth, it's the truth itself. So believe the truth, guard the truth, and then practice the truth. It, it's really not much good to know what's right if you won't do it. Verse 16, now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Uh, one, be encouraged. You know, we do have hope because of the Lord. But he says, uh, the Lord can establish you in every good word and work. That's pretty much what we do. What we say and do uh, needs to, to be guided by the truth. Uh, we're, the Bible says we're saved unto good works. Uh, we used to hear a song, got to live your religion all the time. Got to walk the straight and narrow and so on. Uh, it's not enough just to know the truth. We need to live it. Uh, believe it, guard it, practice the truth. Uh, live it is an important part of, of our faith. Let me encourage you. you know, Jesus is coming again. We, we're going to go through some tough times. They'll probably get tougher. Uh, but the, the Lord knows. And uh, he says that the Lord shall consume that wicked one with uh, the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy him with the brightness of of his coming. We have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, same thing really is to, to do in suffering in the will of God. Uh, thank him for your salvation. Surrender to his will. Ask God to give you wisdom. Look for opportunities. Wait patiently on the Lord. Uh, th there's great hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Any questions or comments before we take some prayer requests tonight?